This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. threatened. It's the decisions of an instant that make heroes. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of actions above and beyond the call of duty on Rescue 911. We begin on March 4th, 1988 in Little Burn, Georgia. A quiet community that's always given Wendy Fisher and her family a sense of security. It was a school day. It was a Friday afternoon. Tristan and Angie had gone upstairs and changed and everything, and they were going out to ride the go-kart. Okay, girls, have a good time and be careful. Bye-bye. The girls had wanted a go-kart for a while, so my parents got them the go-kart. It was kind of the thing that year. There were a lot of kids in the neighborhood that had gotten go-karts. And since our neighborhood just has one entrance into it, there's not always a lot of traffic. They always have to wear helmets, and they had a little flag that stuck on the back. You know, it would be up pretty high so the cars couldn't see them. Pam Williams and a friend were at a nearby tennis court. As we were playing tennis, we noticed the go-kart in the woods. They were darting back and forth, and they came into our field of vision several different times while we were playing. Mm -hmm. Trista was showing me where the start hill was, where we were going to jump over it. But I was real scared to go over that hill because I was afraid I would fall off the um, go-kart. So Trista said, okay, I'll do it by myself. You know, I felt real stupid being by myself, and I wanted to be... If she was going to do it, I was going to do it. So I got on it. When a pickup truck slammed into a go-kart carrying 11-year-old Trista Fisher and her friend Angie, a neighbor heard the crash and immediately called for help. A call to 911 sent rescue units from the Gwinnett County Fire Department to the scene. Neighbor Bob Burns drove over to see if anyone had been hurt. When I could make it out that it was a go-kart, then I put two and two together, and I, I figured out that it, it was Trista. I didn't see him. I thought I missed him. The first thing I did was I took her pulse, and I couldn't find a pulse in her arm. There's a little pulse there. Then I looked to breathing. see if she was breathing, and she wasn't breathing. So then I took note of my wristwatch, because I knew that if she wasn't breathing, we had about four minutes that we had to make sure she got oxygen within that period of time. Pam and her tennis partner who was a nurse, ran to help. Angie was trapped behind Trista, and Angie was conscious, and she was very frightened, um, a little bit panicky, probably, and she was trying to get Trista off of her. Linda Anderson recognized Trista because she knew the girl's mother. Are you all right? Her neck was flopped forward, similar to a doll whose head is broken. No, she's not breathing. We may have to move the truck. I am an RN, and there's another RN on the scene. We debated about whether to move Trista at all, knowing that the number one rule is don't move a victim. But the 
bottom line was Jessa was not breathing. So still watching my watch, it got to be about two minutes and 45 seconds. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if we've got to do something, we've got to start it now. So I talked to one of the nurses, and I said, uh, she's not getting any oxygen. And I don't hear any sirens, and we've got to move her. Do you want me to call Mrs. Fisher? Yes, Paige, call, call Wendy. Cutting in during that. At that point in time, I talked to the driver of the truck again, and I said, we're going to have to back up this truck. And I said, you back it up very carefully and make sure you don't go forward. And when you back it up, I'm going to try and lift the bumper a little bit just to clear the helmet that Trista had on to make sure that the bumper doesn't drag her head back. Okay. Okay, go back. Lift, guys. Come on, lift it up. Lift it up. Back, back a little more. That's good. That's good. Okay, that's good. I went back to Trista, and I picked up Trista's head. It was laying over. I picked it up straight, and I said, we're going to hold this head straight, and we're going to make sure that there's no tension or pressure on her spine, because I'm afraid that there's a neck injury. One, two, three. I felt uh, that if we moved her, she'd probably die. I also felt that if we didn't move her, she would die. I just didn't feel that we could stand there and watch the little girl die without giving her every opportunity to live, even as slim as that opportunity might seem to be. Breather, breather. Go, go. It was a scary situation, and we tried to react the best we could under the circumstances and make the best decision. But at that point, we didn't know if our decisions had been the right ones or not. I prepared myself to do cardiac massage, thinking that her heart might stop as well. The strength of her heartbeat was fading quickly. The accident had occurred just a block and a half from Trista's house. Her mother, Wendy, got there within minutes. Her blood color was just kind of a grayish color, and I was just trying to add her head in. And I was just saying, you know, this is mom, you're going to be okay. Chloe's well, right here. It was just a real hard, you know, to go through. When first rescue units arrived, paramedic Greg Long took charge at the scene. We were assuming the worst as we were en route to the car. It was relief to have them take over. It just was becoming so clear that we were in a really tragic situation and we were so afraid of her dying. I need some cricoid pressure right here. Push down to six. Trista wasn't moving a lot of air. She was breathing about nine times a minute, which was not good for a child her age if she wasn't breathing enough. Somebody got a stethoscope. So we opened her airway, and at that point, I elected to put an endotracheal tube and began to breathe for her. Started to hyperventilate her, really. What's the ETA on life like? 15 minutes. In Trista's case, it was a little odd because normally everybody we ever pick up gets a cervical collar. Well, for some reason, a little voice that was inside me said, don't put a cervical collar on this patient. And I usually go with a little voice. I've been a paramedic for 13 years, and I've learned to rely on it. Yeah, let's go ahead and get the C-spine control. We went through our usual routine of packaging the patient, but something told me to just taper down, put the sheet rolls on and go with it. A life flight helicopter transported Trista the 17 miles to Eggleston Children's Hospital. I wasn't able to ride in a helicopter with her, and um, I had no idea where Eggleston Hospital was, and it seemed to take forever to get, which is about maybe 30 minutes from here, but it seemed like eternity getting there. hospital had already been alerted. A prompt team was waiting to examine Trista the moment she arrived. Orthopedic surgeon Thomas Whitesides was also called in. The situation that Trista was in was extremely precarious. She was near death. Small. An x-ray of her neck showed that her head had been pulled loose from her neck. She was given a bone graft in her neck and put in a halo cast to give it a chance to heal. They couldn't tell us, you know, how she would be or anything because he had never seen anybody survive 
an injury like this. Four. It's just real hard. You know, one minute I see her and she's, you know, laughing and just all happy. And, you know, the next minute she's just laying there and just not moving at all. For Trista's father, the accident was also devastating. You look for the best you can out of the situation. We were informed that she didn't have any movement on her left side and that she would be paralyzed on the left side. She's going to survive. That's certainly the good news. Now you progress from there. The next area, of course, is what's going to happen to her quality of life. Two and a half years have passed. Trista has, has come a long way since the accident occurred. She's uh, progressing, of course, much better than the initial prognosis indicated, the fact that she would be paralyzed if she made it through. And uh, to see her walking around now, laughing and riding a bicycle, and it's, uh, it's a miracle. She's a miracle child. She still attends special therapy sessions to improve both her vision and speech. I was really determined because before my accident, I was always like real active and stuff, and I didn't want to like be sitting around after my accident just doing nothing. So I was determined to be like I used to be. My goal is to um to keep improving until I'm satisfied. Chris is a survivor. She's always a doer. So I think the same energy that got her into the trouble in the beginning that was also what was going to pull her through. And I believe that throughout the whole ordeal, that she is a survivor. She was a little miracle. Anybody that doesn't believe in miracles, there's one walking around in Gwinnett County today. <laughs>